Hi everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page, Dr. Srinivas Concepts. This is Dr. Srinivas, Neurologist from Rajamandri, Andhra Pradesh. I am also the medical author of the book, Focused Neurology. Today we are going to talk about a very, very important and fascinating topic, Cognitive Neurology Part 6, Aphasia Clinical Anatomy Part 2. Cognitive Neurology Part 6, Aphasia Part 2, Clinical Anatomy. So, Aphasia Clinical Anatomy Part 2. We are going to talk about all the interesting concepts of the relevant clinical anatomy of the language disorders. The relevant clinical anatomy of the language is the perisylvian area. So the entire language zone that encompasses these areas is perisylvian that is borders the sylvian fissure. So perisylvian area is the most important area for language and there are four main language areas situated in most persons in the left cerebral hemisphere. Two language areas are receptive that is for understanding speech and two language areas are for executive that is the production. So the receptive language areas, the two important areas of the receptive language areas are vernix area, two is the angular gyrus. Vernix area is the area of 22 and 41 and the angular gyrus is the area 39. Vernix area is the most important receptive language area. It subserves the perception of spoken and probably of internal language that is comprehension. So understanding of speech is done by the vernix area, area 22 and 41. The second receptive language area is angular gyrus, area 39. It is the inferior parietal lobule where the integrative centers for cross modal visual and auditory language functions are located that is reading and writing. So reading and writing are also the important components of language and they are situated in angular gyrus. So if angular gyrus effect is, gets affected, it produces disorders of reading and writing. The classic example is Gerstmann syndrome where the angular gyrus gets affected on the dominant hemisphere. So they'll have difficulty in reading known as alexia. They have difficulty in writing known as agraphia. So the two important receptive language areas are the vernix area and angular gyrus. Likewise, executive language areas, the production of speech, it is also it also resides in two important areas. The Broca's area, very, very important area 44 and 45. And second is the Exner writing area. Broca's area, area 44 and 45. It is situated at the posterior end of the inferior frontal convolution and is concerned with the motor aspects of speech, that is fluency of speech. The normal word output is 100 to 115 words per minute. But if Broca's area gets affected, it causes Broca's aphasia, where the speech may be reduced to as less as 10 to 15 words per minute. So the normal word output is 100 to 115 words per minute. And the Broca's area is immediately adjacent to the facial motor area of the precentral gyrus. So Broca's area is basically primarily concerned with the fluency or the word output of the speech. And if Broca's area gets affected, they'll develop Broca's aphasia where they'll have non-fluent speech. And then we have another area known as Exner's writing area. The posterior part of the second frontal convolution, it gives expression to writing. So summarizing these important areas, there are two parallel systems. One for understanding of the spoken word, vernix area. Second is for producing speech, Broca's area. 
and then a second parallel system is for understanding the written word angular gear is for reading and producing writing exner's area so fantabulous concept we have two parallel systems one for the language in form in in terms of understanding speech the spoken language understanding the spoken language vernix area and producing the uh, spoken language that is the broca's area then for understanding the written word that is reading so angular gear is for reading and for producing writing exner's area there are two parallel systems so we have finally the wernick broca scheme the phonological speech output difficulties are derived from the left frontal lesions that is the broca's area the semantic or the comprehension difficulties are the result of the left temporal lesions that is the wernick's area so alexia and agraphia are associated with inferior parietal lesions that is the angular gyrus lesion classic example is gerstmann syndrome where they have alexia with agraphia they have acalculia they have finger agnosia and then they have the right left disorientation right then we have a repetition affected aphasia which is known as conduction aphasia and then we have a repetition sparing aphasia which are known as transcortical aphasia so for understanding the spoken language is wernick area and arcuate fasciculus con arcuate fasciculus connects the wernick area with the broca's area and is responsible for repetition and finally broca's area is responsible for the word output of this spoken language so when the arcuate fasciculus which connects wernick area and broca's area gets affected repetition gets affected so wernick area is for comprehension arcuate fasciculus is for repetition and broca's area for fluency so when arcuate fasciculus gets affected repetition gets affected so the ability to repeat may be selectively involved with lesions of arcuate fasciculus which connects wernick area with that of the broca's area arcuate fasciculus conducts impulses between the wernick area and broca's area so conduction of is a characteristic characteristic deficit of wernick of uh, arcuate fasciculus characteristic deficit is poor repetition due to involvement of arcuate fasciculus so if arcuate fasciculus gets affected they cannot repeat which is known as conduction aphasia so these are the repetition affecting aphasias known as conduction aphasias then we have repetition sparing aphasias that is known as transcortical aphasias as i told in in the previous slide we have wernick area for understanding arcuate fasciculus for repetition and broca's area for fluency if there are lesions which spares the arcuate fasciculus it indirectly implies that the repetition is spared because arcuate fasciculus is responsible for repetition and if arcuate fasciculus is affected repetition is affected example conduction aphasia if arcuate fasciculus is spared repetition is spared example transcortical aphasias so what are these transcortical aphasias transcortical aphasias are due to border zone infarcts or watershed infarcts between major vessels like anterior cerebral artery and middle cerebral artery known as transcortical motor aphasia or middle cerebral artery and posterior cerebral artery known as transcortical sensory aphasia sensory aphasia they are due to hypoperfusion or hypotension which disconnects the intact core of language network especially the arcuate fasciculus from other areas implying that the arcuate fasciculus is intact leading to the intactness of repetition so we have broca we have wernick area we have the arcuate fasciculus and we have the broca's area so if there is a lesion anterior and superior to the broca's area which is known as transcortical motor aphasia it indirectly implies that the arcuate fasciculus is spared because the lesion is very distal to the arcuate fasciculus likewise if we have a lesion inferior and posterior to the wernick area they develop transcortical sensory aphasia again indirectly implying that the arcuate fasciculus is intact because the lesion is very much distal so in these two transcortical aphasias that is transcortical motor aphasia and transcortical sensory aphasia the arcuate fasciculus is spared so repetition is intact so these are known as repetition sparing aphasias so transcortical motor aphasia 
develops it is always known as watershed infarct or border zone infarct because it develops when there is hyperperfusion between the anterior cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery imagine if there is an embolus it blocks the entire artery but if there is hyperperfusion hypotension so blood is flowing but it is flowing at a very slow speed so the proximal part of the vessels get good blood supply but as they go distally the blood side the blood supply or the perfusion gets decreased and towards the end there is no blood supply at all there's complete stoppage of the blood so when there is hyperperfusion or hypotension the proximal parts of the vessels get good blood supply but as they go distally the blood flow gets decreased and towards the end it completely is a cessation of the blood supply so if there is hyperperfusion between the anterior cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery the proximal parts of the anterior cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery get good blood supply but as they go distally the blood flows slowly become sluggish and the end it becomes completely there's a cessation of the blood flow so it develops that particular area between the anterior cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery the border zone develops infarct which is known as border zone infarct or watershed infarct if it is between anterior cerebral artery and middle cerebral artery we call it as a transcortical motor aphasia so the area the lesion of transcortical motor aphasia is just above and anterior to the broca's area so this is known as transcortical motor aphasia so the manifestations are similar to broca's aphasia namely comprehension is intact in broca's aphasia what happens comprehension is intact fluency is affected repetition is also affected but transcortical motor aphasia is like broca's aphasia but repetition is spared so comprehension is intact but both the repetition and fluency are affected that is transcortical motor aphasia so transcortical motor aphasia is like broca's aphasia but repetition is intact likewise if there's hyperperfusion or hypotension between the middle cerebral artery and the posterior cerebral artery the proximal parts get good blood supply but as they go distally the blood slowly becomes sluggish and at the end complete stoppage of blood flow is there there's a cessation of blood flow between the nca and pca now what we call this as posterior watershed infarct or border zone infarct so here the lesion is inferior and posterior to the wernicke's area so the transcortical sensory aphasia is like wernicke's aphasia but repetition is intact so transcortical aphasia is like wernicke's aphasia but repetition is intact wernicke's aphasia what happens comprehension is affected repetition is affected but fluency is intact whereas in transcortical aphasia is like wernicke's aphasia but repetition is intact because the lesion is very much distal to the arcuate fasciculus indirectly implying that the arcuate fasciculus is intact so as long as the arcuate fasciculus is, in, is intact repetition is intact so these are known as repetition sparing aphasias transcortical aphasias so if, if there is both transcortical motor and transcortical sensory aphasia we call that as transcortical mixed aphasia or isolation aphasia only thing they can do is just keep repeating like a parrot which is known as pallilalia or here someone say something and then they keep repeating what we call as echolalia so very interesting so everything about repetition is concerned with arcuate fasciculus if arcuate fasciculus is affected repetition is affected example conduction aphasia if arcuate fasciculus is intact repetition is intact example transcortical aphasias so transcortical motor aphasia is similar to broca's aphasia but repetition is intact transcortical sensory aphasia is similar to wernicke's aphasia but repetition is intact transcortical mixed aphasia isolation aphasia represents a combination of the two transcortical aphasias so echolalia is present that is they hear something and keep repeating or they keep repeating same word again and again parrot like what we call as pallilalia so only repetition is present in transcortical mixed aphasias again we have very interesting phenomenon known as subcortical aphasias not just broca's of broca's area wernicke's area or arcuate fasciculus are concerned with the language yeah true they are the primary parts of the brain which are concerned with language but there are other parts which may be concerned with language known as subcortical areas like thalamus or caudate nucleus so in thalamus or caudate nucleus gets affected we call that as subcortical aphasias so they don't fit into the typical 
scenario of either broadcast aphasia or vernix aphasia or conduction aphasia they don't fix into a particular type so these are known as subcortical aphasias so subcortical aphasias are damaged due to the subcortical components of the language network example the striatum and the thalamus of the left hemisphere they can also lead to aphasia the resulting syndromes contain combinations of deficits in various aspects of language but rarely fit into the specific patterns there are two subcortical aphasias thalamic and striatocapillar which resemble but not identical to wernicke's and broca's type of aphasia respectively so thalamic re resembles but not identical to wernicke's aphasia and caudate uh, involvement striatocapillar aphasia resembles broca's aphasia but not typical of broca's aphasia so in general striatocapillar aphasia recovers more slowly and less completely than thalamic aphasia yeah this is all the important concepts of uh, speech especially in terms of the clinical anatomy i hope you have enjoyed listening to my lecture as much as much as i have enjoyed delivering it if you have any suggestions or comments kindly post on to my youtube channel dr srinivas medical concepts most of the important concepts of neurology i put in a question answer format in a book written by me focus neurology it is available online from all leading book sellers including uh, amazon you can buy it online if you have any suggestions or comments kindly post on to my youtube channel dr sinwas medical concepts or my web page dr sinwas medical concepts but please like and subscribe my youtube channel dr sinwas medical concepts thank you bye